Howdy folks, this is Father Dougal 9000 here, and welcome to another episode of Dougal's Game Finish Chronicles! The usual series where I talk about the games I've played and beaten as part of the Hardcore Gaming 101 Forums Game Finish Challenge. This is probably going to be the longest video I've made yet, as my write-ups for the following three games were unexpectedly fleshed out. And it'll probably be the longest video for a good while, because the following ones are going to be much briefer. So for those of you who like your YouTube videos to be as lengthy as the Ten Commandments, this will be the closest you're going to get. These games were originally logged from the 19th of February to the 3rd of March 2021. Aihatavo Monogatari for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. About a year ago, I became obsessed with looking into odd and interesting Japanese-only games from the mid-90s, and among them I stumbled across this adventure game with a pretty cool subject matter. I downloaded it, popped it onto my Wii's SNES 9GX emulator, and then completely forgot about it until this week, so I thought I'd finally give it a go. This is an adventure game based on the poet and writer Kenji Miyazawa, whose works might be best known through their animated adaptations, such as Isao Takahata's 1982 take on Gosho the Cellist, and the 1985 cult classic Night on the Galactic Railroad, directed by Gisaburu Sugi of Group TAC? Group TAC? Ugh. You play as a nameless traveler who winds up in the town of Aihatsovo, where you are asked by the ever-elusive Kenji Miyazawa to collect seven journals scattered across the land. Many of the characters and events you run into come from Miyazawa's various works, and all share a common thread of the relationship between man and nature. Whether that be man's treatment of animals, the shared faults and emotions between humans and animals, the spiritual realm, and beyond. The game is structured into a series of chapters, letting each story play around with its specific ideas before moving on to the next, and it feels very much like a collection of stories that you could find in a folklore anthology. It's hard to explain, but they have a mood about them that's easy to understand emotionally and difficult to articulate logically. Sometimes progression is halted by how conveyance of what you need to do next is more often inferred through knowledge of exploring the game and running into people who you might not need to talk to for ages, rather than it being told to you outright. This does fit the overall vibe quite well, but it can make understanding which specific character you're meant to talk to in order to get things going slightly annoying. Apart from that, I Had Tovo is a game I really grew to like. I became quite fond of talking to people each day to see how they're doing, appreciating the small details that change between chapters like what movies being played at the local cinema, and seeing what each new location would offer. Personally, the highlight of the game has to be the sublime soundtrack by Sukasa Tawada. There's something about the way the music is composed and arranged that reminds me a lot of, say, Tomohiro Nishiura's work on Dark Cloud on the PS2 or Hajime Hyakoku and Kanji Ishikawa's soundtrack for the 1992 OVA Uro Urane The Cat Player, where it's dreamlike in a way that's both relaxing and melancholic. Whether it's the theme for the titular city of Aihatovo, the London Dairy Air-esque track that plays in the woods, the melody for the countryside village, the sounds of music celebrating the arrival of the yearly music festival, or even just the piece you hear on the save screen, there's something about it all that really gets to me in a way that I haven't really heard from any of the typically beloved Super Nintendo soundtracks. I'm absolutely dreadful at trying to articulate why I feel so strongly about the soundtrack, but I do. In fact, I'd say it's my favorite Super Nintendo soundtrack by a long shot. In the last couple of years since I originally did this write-up, I've realized that this is that Super Nintendo game that I cherish. I feel like everyone tends to have one particular Super Nintendo game where it means an indescribable amount to them, but I'd never really had that before now. 
I've played a few of the ones that kept cropping up, particularly first-party Nintendo games, but none of them ever did much for me. I Hatsofo Monogatari is that game for me. The game that I think of when people are gushing about Earthbound, Final Fantasy VI, Super Metroid, and goodness knows what else. Not on a literal level, but just emotionally. That Super Nintendo game that I just love. And I'm so glad to finally have that. Metroid Fusion for the Game Boy Advance. Sometime before I started doing these write-ups, I had previously attempted to play this one, got a good ways into it to be fair, but then got horrifically stuck at the boss battle with the big spider, called Yakuza for some mad reason, that grabs you with its pincers and you have to wiggle your way out before you die. At the time, I didn't know that you had to mash left and right on the d-pad to wiggle your way out, and ended up dying with no idea how to avoid getting caught, never mind without taking any damage. Combined with the fairly large amount of time that it takes to get from the save point back to this fight, I figured I wouldn't make any more progress and gave up. However, I had recently found out that the Japanese version introduced an easy mode with bosses being simplified, enemies dealing less damage overall, and health pickups restoring way more than they used to. So I gave it a go, and have evidently beaten it. Having that easier difficulty mode made me appreciate how tough the original fusion is, in a way that kind of reminds me of the old Resident Evils, which is kind of funny since I always compared their focus on item collection and backtracking to Metroid. The game is tough, yes, but in a way that can be overcome once you know what you're doing. Enemies deal more damage than their health pickups restore, so you can never tank your way through encounters. There are plenty of missiles to fend off or freeze enemies in place to either make an escape or get something back, and save points are frequent enough for the most part that retreading areas when you die isn't too bad. So long as you keep a cool head and have quick reflexes, Fusion is a satisfying challenge. By contrast, I originally felt that the easy difficulty skewed a bit too far in reducing the challenge. I often got complacent and started tanking fights, which I was never punished for except for some of the late game bosses, and most combat encounters became a cakewalk even before grabbing most of the upgrades due to how little damage I took. Since Fusion is one of the more linear Metroids, this ended up taking out a lot of the tension and dread often associated with the game. But, for the sake of fairness, I do appreciate this mode being there for folks who want to enjoy the game on their terms if they're not very good, or they want something a bit more breezy. And it was entirely my decision to play it on easy mode. If I want Fusion to be challenging, I can just play it on normal. I know how to break out of the spider boss's grip now, so hopefully it wouldn't be a problem if I wanted to try it again. I quite like the Game Boy Advance Metroid games and how snappily they control, but I don't know, I always end up feeling quite ambivalent towards the games designed around them. Fusion is a linear, action-heavy affair that I can't see myself playing again, at least not terrifically often. And while Zero Mission should appeal to me more because it's got way more exploration going on, the progression is still a bit too guided for my tastes. That's not a criticism of the games, they're just not for me as much as I wish they were. I don't know, maybe I'll give some of those ROM hacks a go. They may not be in as frequent supply as those for the original or Super Metroid, but, you know, they're starting to come out more regularly, so that's pretty cool. Castlevania Circle of the Moon for the Game Boy Advance. Just as a disclosure before I start talking about this in detail, this playthrough was done using the card mode hack by Dev Ange. This is a hack that takes the cards, which are normally obtained as random drops from enemies, and places them in select locations around the map to reward both progress and exploration. 
This allows for a greater use of the card system than you might normally experience, and also makes the game easier in certain parts. So, just so you know, both that this hack exists, and also that I played the game in a not usual way. At this point, I've played roughly half of the Castlevania games that took their cue from Symphony of the Night. You know, a game that gives you an open-ended castle and plenty of action RPG elements like equipment, leveling up, and new items to traverse previously inaccessible areas. Circle of the Moon is a bit of an odd duck in that it was the only one during this era to not be made by the usual team headed up by Koji Igarashi, but instead the Konami studio at Kobe who had just recently developed the Nintendo 64 games and would soon put out the Aces Konami Crazy Racers. That change in staff explains a bunch of things, particularly the return to the somewhat stiff movement and whip of the classic games rather than the smoothly controlling lads that fly all over the shop that you'd see in the Igarashi games, and a greater focus on action than RPG compared to those other games. While this weirdness has led to Circle of the Moon being ignored for Symphony, Aria slash Dawn of Sorrow, or Bloodstained, I actually quite like the game for exactly that reason. It gives the level design, the combat, the exploration its own flair distinct from the others, which I feel suffer from feeling like retreads of what Symphony had already done. I dig how the combat requires skillful use of the whip and sub-weapons in a similar fashion to the old games. I dig how the combat requires skillful use of the whip and sub-weapons in a fashion similar to the original games. And it's pretty cool how the items you find to progress are abilities that improve your ability to run, jump, and generally explore. Some feel a bit too situational, like block pushing or shoulder bashing through walls, but then there are things like the wall jump, which are very helpful in a pinch. I also really like the card system, in how it gives you all kinds of modifiers and playstyles to experiment with, even though the fact that they're randomly dropped is a big problem that makes them heavily restrictive. Hell, the fact that I had to use a hack just so I could get more cards and more easily navigate my way through the game should kind of say it all. But it was pretty great otherwise finally taking on this game properly and finishing it. But, because I played this around the same time as Metroid Fusion, I think I'm done with this subgenre for now. It's a shockingly massive game with a fairly big optional area that I ignored altogether for the sake of just beating the core game, and there's plenty to keep me coming back with three, three alternate character configurations for the post game. That's very awesome, but god almighty that was way too exhausting for me to even consider trying. It is a big, big game. It took me well over a week and a half to get through, and I am good with not playing these Metroidvanias again for a while. Good grief. And with that, we've wrapped up another episode of the series. Hey, I hope that you enjoyed watching and that you'll tune in for the next video. Thank you so much, and until we meet again, have a wonderful day.